Great. So welcoming all of you and all of the parts of you and all of the things that are alive. As we check in with ourselves and we recognize the joys and the sorrows that are present, we, I think, I believe, I've experienced our capacity to hold both of those things increases. Because they're both here all the time in different magnitudes, right? We might feel a bit more of one or the other, but the truth is that it's all happening all the time. And that that tuning in, I find, helps us to be with the, the challenges with greater ease and helps us to increase an awareness of that which is bringing us ease or that which is bringing us joy or contentment or peace or tranquility or what's bedazzling us. Like whatever it is, it's like, oh, this is here. Because that other stuff, it can be really sticky and we're not, we're not so aware. So thanks for for playing along with me. This evening, as the first Monday of the month, we will do a recitation of the five mindfulness trainings from the Plum Village community of engaged Buddhism. And we'll explore different iterations of that as time goes on, but that'll be the first Monday of the month. And my intention is moving forward and we'll see what actually happens. And we'll begin with a sit and then we'll go in that direction. Yeah, so welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective and welcome specifically to Spiritual Friends Sangha's Mindful Mondays. I'm Augusta Hopkins and I'm really glad that you're all here. And if I were to play along and follow that prompt. So Augusta Hopkins, he, she, her. feel settled and content and also curious to learn how these trainings will land for you. For some of you, this might be the first time that you're hearing them and for others of you, they might be really familiar and look forward to the, the discussion that follows them about how they land or, or don't land. Yeah, so find your, find your posture. Maybe you're already in it. Maybe you want to make some small adjustments or some large adjustments. One more layer, one less layer, one more sip. Big stretch, little stretch. It's really, I find, really important to spend time moving the body a bit before coming into stillness. <clears throat> I find that it allows me to recognize what posture would be most supportive for right now. The body's always changing. Our needs are always changing. Can we check in and discern, recognize what we might need right now? And then give that to ourselves. Awareness. And some kind action. As the body settles into stillness, allowing the eyes to close, if that's supportive for you. If open eyes is what the body's calling for right now, allowing the gaze to fall upon the floor. About 45 degrees is often offered and softened. Or you might turn and face a blank wall or if lying down supports you, the ceiling. Allow the gaze to settle on something that's still, ideally not activating. Or some people like a candle. Finding your way into the here and now, into this time and this place, wherever you might be here in person at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, at home or somewhere else listening, allow yourself to be here, wherever that is. And to experience 
the arising and passing of the sound of the bell. A little wake up sound. And then three full invitations. Thich Nhat Hanh offers that the bell is the voice of the Buddha calling us home. <clears throat> Listen, listen, the sound of this bell brings me back to my true home. Just as the sound of the bell arises and passes, so too does each breath, each thought, each emotion, each bodily sensation, each sound, each sight, each conditioned experience. They are all arising and passing. Arising and passing. In the present moment, <laughs> and we can practice to be mindful, awake, aware of all these conditioned experiences. They come and they go. That is their nature. Sometimes we can rest down into awareness. Mm -hmm. 
allowing our bodies to receive the hug of gravity, this gentle embrace that we mostly miss, right? We don't notice most of the time unless we drop something and it breaks. We're not usually thinking about or tuned into gravity. It's such a constant. We can tune into gravity and feel the hug of the earth holding us close. A gentle embrace. We can notice how that feels to rest, to let go, to settle. So feel the hug. To experience being held. And if this experience of resting is interesting enough to you, you can practice for these 20, 30 minutes, just resting down and resting into awareness. Observing the experience of settling that happens quite naturally when we get out of the way. So exploring that, if that feels supportive, or if you find you need a little bit more choosing a more specific, less broad, object of awareness, the experience of breath arising and passing, wherever it's most pleasant or easiest to observe the breath. It might be the nostrils. Feeling the air coming in through the nostrils. Feeling the air going out through the nostrils. And noticing that all the while, the mind is thinking, no problem, that's just what it does. As we start to put our attention somewhere else, it quiets a little bit. Recedes into the background or slows down gradually over time.
as we tune in elsewhere. My thoughts become a little less sticky. Not because we're trying to stop thinking. But because we're cultivating awareness of other things, other experiences. We're not preferencing the thoughts. Just as when we're navigating the various difficulties of life, the abundance of dukkha, we can practice to put our attention elsewhere and notice the wholesome, the nourishing that's also present right here with the dukkha. Oh, and then the charge, it's just not, just not quite as intense. It's not that it's not there anymore. Our relationship to it shifts. And so we practice. In whatever way is most supportive for you, we'll continue with some more instructions, but really finding your way. And if you're exploring the breath with me, noticing how it feels when it comes in the nostrils. Where is it perceived? Back deep in the nasal cavity, almost in the throat. On the rim of the nostril. Somewhere in between. What's the temperature of the breath? Maybe slightly cooler coming in, slightly warmer going out. Maybe, check it out. Come to know for yourself. Sometimes as we begin to settle, we might notice that the mouth is salivating and we'll have a need to swallow. If we rest the tip of the tongue on the roof of the mouth, close to the base of the teeth, the need to swallow decreases. We can get a little bit more stillness, a little more settledness of the body. When we practice, we cultivate this settledness of the body as a support for allowing the mind to settle. Not because it's better to be still, you're not supposed to move, but because as the body settles, the mind has the greater capacity to settle. It's a little easier. But 
And that settling can happen through the rhythm of walking meditation. It's not about stillness. It's about resting and being with ourselves. Allowing ourselves, allowing this moment to be as it is. Allowing ourselves to be as we are. The breath, the body, the thoughts, the emotions. Ah, it's like this. Maybe awareness of the breath in the nostrils is supporting you to settle. Stay there. Enjoy that. Or continue to journey with me. Experiencing the sensation of breath in the chest. Experiencing the gentle expansion and contraction of the ribs that accompanies each breath. Perhaps being soothed, noticing that maybe the nervous system is being soothed by awareness of this gentle movement that's always happening. The difference being that we're tuning into it. We're holding it in awareness, openness, receptivity, And the mind keeps thinking, no problem. Assessments arise and pass, judgments, longings, fantasies. It's okay. This is what the mind does. When we notice that, that's a moment of mindfulness. Worthy of celebration and appreciation. We can be aware of how it feels to be mindful and appreciate that. Allowing that experience of mindfulness to broaden and be known as we settle back into our chosen object of awareness. It might be sound, each sound arising and passing.
Noticing our heart's response, our mind's response to each conditioned experience. An openness or resistance, a pushing away or an embracing. We can be aware of this too. All can be held with mindfulness. Mindfulness does not care what it is mindful of.
with whatever level of awareness is present, broadening that awareness to include movement, gradually moving the body in whatever ways feel good. You might just start with the fingers or toes, or maybe the whole body's ready to move. Listen to your body and respond to that wisdom. And keeping our eyes closed for just a little bit longer as we first bring in movement, I think helps us to feel the movement a little bit more. And then when you're ready, as you're ready, bring in light and noticing what you see, allowing this experience of sight to be held in the field of awareness, just as we've been practicing with, with sounds and thoughts and emotions and the breath in the body, sight too can be held in the field of awareness. <clears throat> I often find it's helpful to choose something to notice seeing as I open my eyes, shapes, colors, are specifically linear and nonlinear things. If you've been sitting cross-legged, it's especially nice to do a forward fold. And in any posture, it can be super helpful to twist. Walt, is my proximity to the mic working out okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So as I said this evening, we'll enjoy the five mindfulness trainings. So you're welcome to receive them in ever, whatever way works for you. You might just kind of sit in meditation and let the eyes close and let them come in or maybe you want to look at me. It's all good. In the future, I might hand things out. I'm going to try it this way this evening and see how that goes. But maybe some of you have heard of the five precepts, which are very simply stated as not stealing, killing, lying, committing adultery, consuming intoxicants, stealing, killing, lying, committing adultery, and, and intoxicants. Like, bare bones. And Thich Nhat Hanh and the Plum Village community of engaged Buddhism has extrapolated those again and again over the years, first more than 50 years ago. And this is the most current iteration and they've, they've changed recently, which is why I don't have handouts. <laughs> and it's lovely that, they, that they're a living document. So the five mindfulness trainings. The five mindfulness trainings have their root in the five precepts offered by the Buddha. They've been expanded and updated so that they represent a way to bring mindfulness into every area of life. Rather than hard and fast rules, they offer us a framework to reflect on our actions, speech, and thinking. So we, so we can create more happiness for ourselves and the world around it, the world around us. And then some words from, from my teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. The five mindfulness trainings are one of the most concrete ways to practice mindfulness. They are non-sectarian, and their nature is universal. They are true practices of compassion and understanding. All spiritual traditions have their equivalent to the five mindfulness trainings. The first training is to protect life, to decrease violence in oneself, in the family and in society. The second training is to practice social justice, 
generosity, not stealing, and not exploiting other beings. The third is the practice of responsible sexual behavior in order to protect individuals, couples, families, and children. The fourth is the practice of deep listening and loving speech to restore communication and reconcile. The fifth is about mindful consumption to help us not bring toxins and poisons into our body or mind. The five mindfulness trainings are based on the precepts developed during the time of the Buddha to be the foundation of practice for the entire lay practice community. I have translated these precepts from modern times because mindfulness is at the foundation of each one of them. With mindfulness, we are aware of what is going on in our bodies, our feelings, our minds, and the world. And we avoid doing harm to ourselves and others. Mindfulness protects us, our families, and our society. When we are mindful, we can see that by refraining from doing one thing, we can prevent another thing from happening. We arrive at our own unique insight. It is not something imposed on us by an outside authority. Practicing the mindfulness trainings therefore helps us be more calm and concentrated and brings more insight and enlightenment. I'll say for me, of course, there's a lot in there that, that resonates and I think is, is valuable. And this evening, the sentence that pops out at me to repeat is as a result of this practice, we arrive at our own unique insight. It is not something imposed on us by an outside authority. I think sometimes the precepts or the mindfulness trainings can feel like, do this. And that's not the intention. So I hope that this language, it helps us to feel that. Then it's like, oh, here's some suggestions. And then our own insights arise. We'll see. I look forward to hearing all about it in a little bit. So here we go. I gave you a big introduction, so I'm going to skip the introduction. Okay, the first mindfulness training. The first mindfulness training, reverence for life. Aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, I am committed to cultivating the insight of interbeing and compassion and learning ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. I am determined not to kill not to let others kill, and not to support any act of killing in the world, in my thinking or in my way of life. Seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking, I will cultivate openness, non-discrimination, and non-attachment to views in order to transform violence, fanaticism, and dogmatism in myself and in the world. This is the first mindfulness training, reverence for life. Enjoying a few breaths and awareness or a few moments of resting in and down. Just notice what's there, how it percolates, how there's resonance or dissonance. What stays with you? Did you miss it all? No problem. Reverence for life. This is the first of the five mindfulness trainings. 
The second mindfulness training, true happiness. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing, and oppression, I am committed to practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others. And I will share my time, energy, and material resources. I will practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others are not separate from my own happiness and suffering. That true happiness is not possible without understanding and compassion. And the running after wealth, fame, power, and sensual pleasures can bring much suffering and despair. I'm aware that happiness depends on my mental attitude and not on external conditions, and that I can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that I already have more than enough to be happy. I am committed to practicing right livelihood so that I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on earth and stop contributing to climate change. This is the second mindfulness training, true happiness. The third mindfulness training, true love. Aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I'm committed to cultivating responsibility and learning ways to protect the safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families, and society. Knowing that sexual desire is not love and that sexual activity motivated by craving always harms myself and others. I am determined not to engage in sexual relations without mutual consent, true love, and a deep long-term commitment. I resolve to find spiritual support for the integrity of my relationship from family members, friends, and Sangha with whom there is support and trust. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and to prevent couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. Seeing that body and mind are interrelated, I am committed to learn appropriate ways to care for my sexual energy and to cultivate the four basic elements of true love. Loving kindness, compassion, joy, and inclusiveness for the greater happiness of myself and others. Recognizing the diversity of human experience, I am committed not to discriminate against any form of gender identity or sexual orientation. Practicing true love, we know that we will continue beautifully into the future.
This is the third mindfulness training, true love. The fourth mindfulness training, loving speech and deep listening. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful speech and the inability to listen to others, I am committed to cultivating loving speech and compassionate listening in order to relieve suffering and to promote reconciliation and peace in myself and among other people, ethnic and religious groups and nations. Knowing that words can create happiness or suffering, I am committed to speaking truthfully, using words that inspire confidence, joy, and hope. When anger is manifesting in me, I am determined not to speak. I will practice mindful breathing and walking in order to recognize and to look deeply into my anger. I know that the roots of anger can be found in my wrong perceptions and lack of understanding of the suffering in myself and in the other person or people. I will speak and listen in a way that can help myself and those others, those perceived others, to transform suffering and see the way out of difficult situations. I am determined not to spread news that I do not know to be true and not utter words that can cause division or discord. I will practice right diligence to nourish my capacity for understanding, love, joy, and inclusiveness, and gradually transform anger, violence, and fear that lie deep in my consciousness. This is a fourth mindfulness training, loving speech and deep listening. Noticing resonance, dissonance, that you missed it. A word or phrase. The fourth mindfulness training. Loving speech and deep listening. And the fifth of the five mindfulness trainings, nourishment and healing. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption, I am committed to cultivating good health, both physical and mental, for myself, my family, and my society by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. I will practice looking deeply into how I consume the four kinds of nutrients, namely, edible foods, sense impressions, volition, and consciousness. I'm determined not to gamble or to use alcohol, drugs, or any other products which contain toxins, such as certain websites, electronic games, TV programs, films, magazines, books, and conversations. So certain ones, right? It's not saying to not engage with those things, but certain websites, games, etc. I will practice coming back to the present moment to be in touch with the refreshing, healing, and nourishing elements in me and around me, not letting regrets and sorrow drag me back into the past 
nor letting anxieties, fear, or craving pull me out of the present moment. I am determined not to try to cover up loneliness, anxiety, or other suffering by losing myself in consumption. I will contemplate intervening and consume in a way that preserves peace, joy, and well-being in my body and consciousness and in the collective body and consciousness of my family, my society, and the world. This is the fifth mindfulness training, nourishment and healing. So those are the five mindfulness trainings. A lot of reading, a lot of words. Maybe some of it landed. Maybe none of it landed. Maybe things came and went. It's all good. It's all good. The question is, is there anything that's in there that feels resonant to you? It feels like it's helpful for you. Some ways that you think that it's not helpful or not supportive for you, right? This space where both can be true, just as we were practicing in the beginning, like what are the joys and the sorrows? Like we're gonna have resonance and dissonance, no problem. This is part of what allows us to, to grow and live and co cultivate this community that we're building here together. Yeah. So in the Plum Village community, we have the opportunity to receive a transmission of these trainings, to make a commitment to live our lives in alignment with them. And it's really important to me that that commitment, it's not a, I'm never going to do any of these things ever again in my life. And if I do, I'm a terrible person. It's, oh yeah, I've noticed, aware of the suffering caused by. Now, I probably could talk about them for, we have got 25 minutes or so, I probably could keep and talk about them for the 25 minutes and I'll share more for sure. And I wanted to really have space this evening so that you can ask questions or you can share your reflections and we can keep building the community here that we're building. So I'm gonna stop talking for the moment. And as you're inspired, just come and, and grab the mic and share about something in this that, as I pet my phone, you know, share about something in this that, that landed or didn't land something that feels good or where there's some kind of resistance. And you know, you don't need to remember the specific words. My Angelou is amazing in thousands of ways, where one of her quotes that stays with me is that people are not gonna remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. So you might remember like how some of the words feel in you, right? Who cares about the particular words? That's not what it's about. But anything that might be here from, from those of us who are gathered at the Dharma Collective and, and people who are online, as well.